this sermon isn't just for marriages at all. This sermon is how do we find comfort, hope, joy, and happiness in the midst of difficult and trying times. Before I start, I just want to thank LifePoint. Since I left the law, and it was hard leaving the practice. I've learned it's really easy to get to the edge of the diving board, but then it's hard to jump off the high dive. But I had a wife who, when I got to the edge, said, Brad, would you quit looking back and wasting our energy? God's call is to this, let's do it. And since I've left the law, Life Point has been like a second church home for us. And you guys have been so encouraging, so helpful. You've worked on your marriages. We've learned together on how to help marriages. And yes, I wish you were all out here. But I also praise God that we're, I'm able to come into your home today and talk to you. And for the kids, I know, I hope your kids do better with virtual church than ours. Um, they don't do perfect out here, but they do a lot worse on our couch. <laughs> so um, just think about since last year, I was here a year ago. Think nobody had a clue what we were stepping into a year ago, did we? In the last year, we have COVID, tornadoes, natural disasters, political division, I mean, whoever thought when I preached last year, within three months, toilet paper and Clorox wipes would be the most valuable commodity that people stuff their grocery carts with. There has been a ton of change, a ton of uncertainty. But I'm here to say our hope, our comfort, our joy, it is as secure or more secure than it has ever been. And if you're like me, I've had struggles. I've worked through this. I've had anxieties. I've not handled things well. And what's that caused me to do? It has caused me to cry out to God for help. Because God uses trials. God uses stuff like this to draw us closer to him and make us more effective for the gospel, both individually and in our marriages. I was watching the ball drop and all that other stuff. And I said, praise God, 2020 is behind us. 2021 is here. Aren't we excited? Well, our hope's not in 2021. And I wish I could be guaranteed that 2021 was gonna be a lot better than 2020, but we have no guarantee of that. But we have one guarantee, and that's Jesus Christ is on his throne. And our hope is secure. And all these trials are going to do is make us more mature and complete. Listen to the book of James. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness or perseverance. And let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So as you're struggling, know God is using it in your life. For us, I preach this sermon out of a lot of difficulties this year. I didn't know what 2020 was going to bring. It brought the sudden loss of my father-in-law and my wife's lifelong biggest fan. The steady source of love, comfort, and Christ into our family all of a sudden, within a day, went from healthy to gone so I've watched my wife um, cry a lot, uh, sad a lot, but I, we know he's with Jesus. And we're thankful that the tears are beautiful tears, uh, recollecting on what a godly man he was. Plus, I've had a lot to process personally, health scares, heart testing. I went from a really good sleeper <laughs> to just laying in bed at three, four in the morning and just can't go to sleep. Last night, I don't know if you have trouble sleeping, but the night you know you need sleep or the night you sleep the worst. It's like two last night and I am just laying in bed saying, God, please help me sleep. And finally, I did fall asleep. Normally, I'm very optimistic and an extrovert. This summer, I don't know if it was the COVID fears or all the stuff that's going around, going on, but I found myself lethargic and 
lacking energy and short of breath and life was a real struggle. But I just want to encourage you. The Lord has used all that to make me rely less on me and more on him. I cried out to God, prayed more, sought God more, read more, talked to more mature believers this year than probably any year that I can remember because God uses this stuff to bring us close to him. God is faithful. We will be okay. This right here, this is a picture of our family. That's uh, my four daughters and uh, my son and my wife. And um, that picture, our family's not nearly as pretty as that picture looks. In fact, while that picture was taken, I was trying to pass a kidney stone, trying to act happy for the picture. We have one daughter in there. I won't say which one, but she's kind of our insider. She's the one that if, if, if everything's going peaceful, she wants to make sure she fixes that for us sometimes. She told us recently, she said, Dad, I bring the looks, the personality, and the humor to the family. You can't ask me to bring the neatness and the niceness too. So I just tell you, if you're having trials, if you're having significant struggles, it's okay, you're normal. John 16, says, in this world, you will have troubles, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Every person that I know well has big stuff going on in their life. Everybody. The only folks I know that don't have significant stuff going on in their life are the people that I don't really know. So let's start. How do we view, how do we respond to trials, both individually and in marriage? Let's start with how we view trials. Okay, from the world's perspective, how do we view it? Wealth, good. Poverty, bad. Health, good. Sickness, bad. Comfort, good. Discomfort, bad. So if somebody says, I'm blessed, typically that means something's good happened to me in this earth. But I'll tell you, Scripture does not have that view of blessing. Listen to what Scripture says about blessings. Blessed are those who are persecuted. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who wait. Blessed who are those who are patient under trials. Blessed are those who believe, trust, rely, and whose hope is in the Lord is what the book of Jeremiah says. It doesn't say blessed are the rich, the healthy, the powerful, and the comfortable. No. So this year, we don't realize it, but a lot of us are extremely, extremely blessed. Actually, Scripture, when it talks about wealth and and worldly stuff. And he actually talks about the dangers of it. Easier for a camel to enter the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. So sometimes we desire the things that make it hardest to draw closer to the Lord Jesus Christ. So I don't like trials. I don't like pain. I don't like kidney stones. I don't like watching my wife cry, but I know. My hope is in God. It is not in this world. So that's how we view trials. So now how do we respond to trials? Listen to the book of James. What are we, how are we supposed to respond to trials? Count it all joy. Romans, rejoice. Romans, be patient in affliction. So I've asked myself when I'm in the fetal position, hurting too bad to watch television because I have a kidney stone. How do you rejoice? How do you have joy in the midst of that? When you're on a date and your wife's sobbing because she's missing her dad, how do you rejoice and have joy in that? And I've, I've learned it's because joy does not come from the world. Joy is not circumstantial. Our hope is not in a vaccine. Our hope is not in everything stabilizing. Our hope is in the Lord Jesus Christ and that is where joy is found. That's why the apostles could celebrate, rejoice right after they took a beating to the point of death. Why? Because they were totally focused on King Jesus and they knew their hope was not in this world. And I've been blessed to have some good examples. We have a lady in our church, she's married 25 years. Um, she lost her husband recently. Um, 
not to COVID, but lost him. I saw her at church and she did a massive COVID violation, came sprinting across the service and just hugged me. And then she was smiling. I said, Phyllis, how are you smiling? She goes, my Jim's in heaven. He's not in pain. God gave me 25 wonderful years with him. Now she wasn't just in denial. She was sad. She was grieving. She was crying, but she was crying with the radiance of God on her face. It was beautiful. And my mentor, one of my best friends who I lost not long ago, he showed it to me as well. I flew out to, this is a picture of him. I flew out to um, California to be with him before he had brain surgery to have one tumor removed from his brain. And uh, when there were others there, and he was going into surgery, not knowing if he was gonna make it or not. He was as peaceful and as calm and as sweet as he'd ever been. And I said, how are you doing? And I was with his, his wife was there with me. He said, I'm doing good. He said, cause I'm either gonna wake up and look at Jesus, or I'm gonna wake up and look in the eyes of my wife. He goes, two pretty good options. Don't worry about me. What an example. And I wonder, you know, how do we get to that point? Um, our point is to, to take our eyes off the world and fix our eyes on things above. Fix our eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how we remain patient in suffering. And so, and also we must realize that suffering is not just random misery to fear. Because I don't know about you, but when I see a 41-year-old with no underlying conditions die, when I see all of a sudden all these things around me, I almost find myself in fear. What's going to happen next? But Scripture says, have no fear of sudden disaster. Have no fear of sudden disaster. Now, used to, I try to take comfort in that, in that verse thinking, okay, I don't have to fear sudden disaster because God will not let that happen to me. So I don't have to fear it. No, now I know I don't have to fear it because to die is gain. And the Lord Jesus Christ is sufficient and he's using trials. Because if you know there's a purpose for the trial, it's much easier to endure. And listen to James, it says trials, they make us more mature, they make us more complete. Romans, they produce endurance, they produce character. And you think of the best soldiers, the best generals, They've been through a lot of fights. And my hunch is they've lost a lot. And they've not handled them all super well, but they've been through a bunch and they've become mature. They've become more complete. And that's what God does for us. Because if I've, as I've gone through all this stuff, now when somebody tells me, man, I'm struggling, man, I feel it, I'm empathetic. I'm texting and praying much more because I have a better idea what they're going through. Trials produce good fruit. I love the quotes from Streams in the Desert. He who suffers most has the most to give. And the greenest grass is found wherever the most rain falls. So one, we realize God is using it. I was talking to a counselor friend of mine and I was telling him all my struggles. He said, Brad, you're on holy ground. So what do you mean? He said, I see the Lord pulling you to him, pull him to the true source of life, to the well that never runs dry. So the last thing we do is we focus on the prize. We're a vapor that's here and gone. We guess we're to richly enjoy all things for his glory, but recognize the brevity of life. So we focus on the prize. Listen to James 1.12. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. As I was laying in bed last night, I couldn't sleep. I almost heard the Lord say, Brad, accept whatever path I have for you and just obey me and remain steadfast and don't worry about it, whatever it is. Look at Romans 8, 18. I consider that the suffering of this present time are not even worth comparing to the glory that's to be revealed to us. So whatever you're going through, believers, it's not even worth comparing to the beauty of what we have ahead for us in the Lord Jesus Christ. So the key is 
we fix our eyes on things above, not on worldly things. We take our eyes off the news and put it on the good news. We stop reading COVID stats and all this stuff all the time. And like Pat said, we immerse ourselves in scripture and we go to things that bring peace, not that bring anxiety. Because look at this hope continuum. If our hope is in this world, COVID, dissension, economic troubles, the more trials that occur, the more we lose hope. If our hope is in Jesus Christ, as trials occur, we become more mature and complete and closer and closer to our true home in heaven. And so how do we do it? We, we pray, we move into things that bring peace, not chaos. Scripture says, don't be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, present your requests to God. So pray, read scripture, make 2021 a year of pursuit of God, a year of immersion in the word, because how are we delivered from our fears? Not a vaccine, not a leader, not a country, but what Psalm 34, four says, I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Therefore, I have no fear of sudden disaster. And believers, I wanna encourage you, really resist temptation because suffering is an opportunity for the devil because if our hopes in the world, we're tempted to try to make the world better. And that's why we see a lot of relapse and a lot of trials in this. If you are having trouble and you're being tempted, you're normal, but resist temptation, continue to obey. And as you hit them, for me, I find there's two ditches in suffering. One is avoidance. Like I tend to, when I'm struggling, I get real busy. I do a lot of work. I run here, I run there. One day I had an hour of free time, which I have five kids. That's rare, very rare. So I sat on the couch and had an hour and I thought, oh my goodness, I haven't given blood in forever. And I'm driving to the blood center as fast as I can. And halfway there, I think, am I just crazy? But I avoid struggle by distraction. The other ditch is self-domination. And that's where all you think about is your struggles. And I got into that point too, where I'm, how am I feeling? Am I anxious? Am I not anxious? And I'm just so self-dominated. So let's strive to have a balance of rest in busyness, not self-dominated, but not avoiding either. And remember, what cast out fear is perfect love. Perfect love cast out all fear. So my friend I was telling you about who had brain surgery, after he got out of brain surgery, I couldn't believe it. He was talking to me and he was being sweet to the nurses and encouraging the nurses. And the nurse walked out and he looked at me and he goes, Brad, isn't it fun loving on people? And I realized he was not focused on his problems. He was focused on loving the person in front of him. So pray, don't be anxious, love well. So now let's shift, let's shift. We've talked about how to navigate suffering and that we're okay because God is in control. Now let's talk about the impact of suffering on the marriage, the pandemic. Is this a curse or is it an opportunity for marriage? It all depends on who you listen to. Wall Street Journal says even in the best of times, marriage and relationships are hard work, but the pandemic has produced a pressure cooker in homes, straining even strong partnerships and experts say likely breaking others. One therapist says where there's a crack, there's now a rupture. So for some, yes, it's making things worse, but for some, it's making things better. An American family survey showed that 58% of married men and women say the pandemic has made them appreciate their spouse more. Especially interesting, those that have had the most significant financial impact negatively have experienced an increase in commitment to marriage. I will tell you, don't be discouraged by the pandemic. If you are right now more annoyed with each other, struggling with each other, that's normal, but you're going to work through it and you're going to, just like God's going to make you more mature and complete, he's going to make your marriage more mature and complete as well. Don't let Satan create some negative fulfilling prophecy. No, we will make it, we will work through it, and we will have a better marriage through it. To encourage you, like I told you, Marilyn and I have had a rough year. I have and Marilyn has, but she told me, 
Brad, I feel like our marriage has never been better. She said, I feel closer to you than I felt to you our entire marriage. So I asked, I asked her, I said, well, babe, how is that? I said, I'm not doing well. You don't seem to be doing that great. How are we so close? And I realized God showed me, it's not about both being rock stars of handling life. It's about intimacy. God's close to the brokenhearted. And I've shared with her my anxiety. She'd shared with me her sorrow. And we are close and we are one. So if you're out there, stay connected, stay intimate. And just some real practical tips. Keep investing in your marriage. Date even when you don't want to and even when COVID makes it hard. Our last date involved going to my office, sitting in my office and talking for two and a half hours because everything else was unavailable because of COVID. Play, enjoy one another, discipline yourself to come together physically even when you don't want to. Remember David and Bathsheba, they lost a child and came together to comfort one another. Draw closer together. Do not let this pandemic pull you apart. And to stay connected, you have to share, share, and share. And when your spouse shares fears and anxieties, don't just tell them it's all gonna be okay. Don't worry about it. Vaccine's coming. Everything's gonna be normalized. Don't try to rescue them. Just listen. Seek to understand. Seek to know one another. And you can be closer to one another than ever, even in the midst of these bizarre times. And see the big picture. You're going through life with your very best friend. And if you're single, make sure you're staying connected. I hate the term social distancing. Whoever invented it was wrong. It should be physical distancing. So if you have to stay apart physically, Zoom, Call, sit within six feet from another, talk, stay connected because God gave us one another for one another and give each other grace. Whatever issues your spouse has are probably worse now than they were a year ago. I can be a little snappy and distant. Now I've been a little more snappy and a little more distant. Marilyn can be sad. She's been more sad but we're more close than other. We're putting our marriage under grace. We're talking and we're staying close and we encourage you to do the same. Listen to 1 Peter 4, 8. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly since love covers a multitude of sins. And struggling together, it's a beautiful thing. When we're sitting in our bedroom and the chair's talking and I just watch the tears pour down Marilyn's face, I think, what a beautiful woman I'm married to. What a beautiful father-in-law I have had. And I'm so close to her. And if you're out there and you're really struggling, you're wondering, can we make it? We can't stand each other. We don't even like looking at each other. Like one couple I counsel with said, when, when he walks in the room, I hate it because I hate even looking at him. <laughs> Don't give up. Remember your vows in good times and bad, for better, for worse, for richer, for poor, in sickness and in health. And in the marathon of marriage, there are going to be some really rough miles. There are going to be some sweet miles. There are going to be some rough miles. But my encouragement to you is, till death do us part, stick with it. Stick with one another. Man, it is, and it's nice because we can help each other because my struggles are different than Marilyn's struggles. For some reason, the fear and anxiety of COVID is hitting me a lot harder than it's hit Marilyn. Marilyn worries a lot more about our kids and how they're doing than I worry about our kids and our, but we can help each other. We've learned not to look down on one another because of our lack of trust and our anxieties, but to help each other within them. So the question is, how does this happen? You know, how can you continue to have a great marriage through all of this? The answer is it takes ongoing investment and prioritization. We have kept dating once a week through this whole thing. 
Yes, some of it's just sitting in a car eating. Some of it's sneaking up to our room, trying to keep our kids out of our room while we're dating, which is almost impossible for us. The world is a dominating place. Satan hates marriage. Satan wants to divide you. Satan wants to destroy you. So be sober-minded and alert. Take care of your marriage. And I t- part, the thing, one of the things I love about LifePoint is th- part of the DNA of this church is healthy, life-giving, God-glorifying, magnetic marriages. And there's, there's a marriage ministry at LifePoint and we all want you part of it. Because great marriages, they just don't happen. They take a fight. They take stiff arming the world and making space for your marriage. So at Life Point, they're just asking you, will you give your marriage four hours every 90 days where you come together with your spouse, where you look big picture, where you plan your next quarter together, where you celebrate wins, where you address issues, Every quarter I come together with Marilyn, I learn of a new issue that we need to work through together, but it keeps us from drifting and we stay close together and we celebrate what we have. We get on the same page, we cast vision and we move forward together and we leave excited about doing life together. LifePoint wants it to be standard operating procedure for married couples to work on their marriage in the marriage ministry. We want it to be that the children and children ministry, the youth are in the youth ministry and the married couples are in the marriage ministry and we're all pursuing the Lord Jesus Christ, trying to him, bring him glory in all of it. Now there are some changes this year at LifePoint in the marriage ministry. That's one thing I love is always making changes to make it better. This year, instead of four sessions, there will be three. The first session will be May 1st. Because of the concerns of COVID, let things stabilize a little bit and there'll be three sessions. The second change is it'll be $150 instead of $200. But if you register before the end of January, it'll be $125, it'll be a $25 discount. Plus in August, my wife and I are very thankful to have been invited to come lead all the groups in here at one time in a corporate coaching session. And my prayer is that that is a celebration, that we are together, we're not distancing, we're hugging and we're celebrating Jesus and we're celebrating him allowing us to be closer together again. And third, this year you're gonna have Grace Marriage at Home. There's now a virtual coaching platform online. And as soon as you sign up, for Grace, for Grace Marriage at LifePoint, you will get access to the virtual platform. And what that will include is, one, it will include a virtual, virtual session. If y'all could move on to the next slide on the, so you'll get a monthly building block lesson. So every month you'll get a video session, a worksheet, structured communication, and then you'll get a get real with Brad and Marilyn. So you'll be able to work on your marriage in your own home at no additional cost. And second, you'll get monthly building blocks, well, bi-weekly, which every two weeks you'll get due date night ideas. You'll get recipe ideas, things just to keep life in your home. And third, you'll get something called Sex Talk with Sheila. Sheila Rugar is an expert in marital sex from a Christian perspective. And every month you'll get a new teaching from Sheila covering things that you probably won't hear from the pulpit. I did the interviews and she about made me blush. I mean, she, there's nothing she leaves uncovered. So if you have a question about intimacy that you would be hesitant to ask Pat or your leadership, she's covering it. So I just wanna close by saying thank you. This is the third year in a row that I've had the privilege of being here. And prayer, encouragement, Y'all have been all of that for me and for Grace Marriage. And our vision at Grace Marriage for LifePoint is to create the prototype of marriage ministry that can be exported all over the country. Right now, 72% of churches have no marriage ministries, according to a community study. My prayer is that God uses LifePoint to develop a prototype that's exported everywhere. And then it's more rare for a church not to have a children's ministry than not to have a marriage ministry. And how do you help? You get involved. 
Because when you sign up for Grace Marriage, you not only take care of your own marriage, you not only protect and grow it, but you set an example for other couples and you set an example for other churches. So please, there's a link and Kyle's gonna come out and tell you more about it. But please join Marilyn and I in investing in your marriage. We love you guys. We are thankful to the Lord Jesus Christ that our comfort, our hope, our security, everything is as secure as it's ever been and it can't be taken away from us. And yes, I pray 2021 is better than 2020, but if it's not, we'll all be just fine because our hope is in Christ and Christ alone. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, we are so thankful to you that the that we can be dominated by hope, by joy, by comfort, by happiness. And then we have, we can stand out like aliens in this world more than ever now because in an atmosphere of anxiety and an atmosphere of fear and an atmosphere of all this stuff, we pray that you would fill us with a radiance and that people would be drawn to the Lord Jesus Christ because they could see that The hope is not in this world. Our hope is in you and our hope is secure. We love you, Lord Jesus Christ. We uh, pray for all the marriages at LifePoint and pray for everybody listening. In Christ's name, amen. Thank you.